first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd appreciate short and succinct questions and answers to match. And at question number one, I call Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with COSLA and Police Scotland to discuss safe access for all women to clinics and hospitals. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government convened a working group in December 2021 with members from COSLA, Police Scotland and councils and health boards that are affected by vigils and protests that take place outside abortion clinics. The group is specifically focused on seeking solutions to ensure that women can access abortion services safely without fear of harassment. The working group last met this morning. That was our third meeting. The agenda and meet minutes from previous meetings can be found on the Scottish Government's website. Katie Clark. Thank you. Last week, at the end of 40 days of continuous demonstrations, there were 100 anti-abortion protesters outside the Queen Elizabeth Hospital maternity unit. Does the Minister accept that women and the workforce are being harassed and that urgent action is needed to bring this type of behaviour to an end? Minister. Does she accept oh. that we need to know that action is being taken urgently and that steps will be taken to ensure that these kind of protests cannot continue? And will the Scottish Government have the courage to bring forward Scotland-wide legislation to create buffer zones? Minister. So let me put on record I was very dismayed to hear about the protests at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital last weekend. There is absolutely no place in our society for the harassment, abuse or intimidation of women and girls who are accessing health care services. The Scottish Government is committed to women being able to access timely abortion without facing judgment. Both our programme for government and our women's health plan included undertakings in this regard, which I hope indicates the importance which we place on this issue. I am working closely and collaboratively and constructively with Gillian Mackay, who has intentions to lodge a Member's Bill on this issue. And I met her in February. She was again at this meeting this morning of the Working Group to meet all of the Working Group members to share her consultation. And we all agreed to work constructively with her on this issue. Question number two, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the rollout of the Home Heating Support Fund. Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The Home Heating Support Fund is delivered on our behalf by Advice Direct Scotland. It reopened at the end of last year with funding provided from our Fuel Insecurity Fund. Uh, since then, it has been successfully helping households at risk of severely rationing their energy use or of self-disconnecting entirely. Uh, and while figures are still being collated, the, the provisional figures show that over uh, 7,300 applications for support have been received by the 11th of April. It will continue to offer household support through the current financial year, thanks to the additional £10 million of funding that we recently announced for the Fuel and Security Fund. Evelyn Tweed. I thank the Minister for that answer. As the Tories waste precious energy running to the defence of their law-breaking Prime Minister and Chancellor, people across Scotland are focused on how to make ends meet, feed their children and keep their homes warm. Does the Minister agree with me that instead of navel-gazing, the Tories must engage with reality and encourage the Chancellor to cut VAT on energy bills as a way of helping people with the cost of living crisis? Minister. Well, I very strongly agree that action must be taken and that a, a short-term cut on VAT on energy fuels, amongst a range of other measures, would be one way of providing short-term relief uh, for households faced with uh, the huge increase in the price cap that has just come into effect uh, and which we expect to get worse later this year. We first suggested such a cut in VAT uh, back in January, and my colleagues, uh, Finance Secretary and the CapSec for Net Zero both reiterated that request when they wrote to their UK government counterparts last month. And we have put forward a range of other actions uh, to uh, address the cost of living crisis, uh, some of which sit with the UK government and some of which, as we discussed, we have already implemented with devolved powers here. Uh, we have been 
uh, pressing for some time for a, 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 an ending of VAT on energy saving measures, which would up, uh, increase the uptake of these products. And it's good that the UK government have finally recognised the merit of this particular measure. We are also continuing to urge them to commit to rebalancing uh, the, uh, the policy cost element of the energy bills to reduce the premium paid by households reliant on electric heating and to unlock the deployment of low uh, and zero emissions heating. Finally, presiding officer, it is astonishing that they have published an energy security strategy which says absolutely nothing about energy efficiency. I am pleased to say that this government continues to place a very high priority on that long-term priority. Question number three, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what help it will provide to tackle any NHS backlogs in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The ongoing impact of addressing the COVID-19 pandemic has meant that many health services have been suspended or reduced in scope and scale. This has, of course, affected almost all aspects of planned care, and as a result, of course, many people are waiting longer for the care they need. I hope the member and the chamber can be assured that addressing this backlog will continue to meet the ongoing urgent health care demands is our top priority. We, of course, published the NHS. Recovery Plan it sets out our plans to address the backlog of care uh, throughout this, the course of the parliamentary term. In Dumfries and Galloway specifically, we are working closely with the Board on their local recovery plan, which recognises their specific challenges. This includes recruitment across a number of key roles to support increased capacity, the use of the independent sector where appropriate, and funding to open short stay and ward beds to accommodate additional activity. Finlay Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. The Scottish Government earlier this month announced that it purchased a private health care hospital, the Carrick Glen, an AR that specialises in orthopaedics. But given the important role that is played by cottage hospitals at Castle Douglas, Kukubri, Newton Stewart, who before the pandemic provided vital health services to nearly 600 patients, can I ask the Health Secretary whether financial assistance will be made available to either retain or replace these crucial local facilities in order to reduce the growing backlog and delay discharge and move palliative care patients closer to home? Cabinet Secretary. Because this is a very uh, important point uh, indeed. And what I will say to him is, of course, it is for local health boards to make decisions and assessments about uh, the, the various premises and acute sites that they have uh, within their health board region. If they come forward to the government with a plan on how, for example, the purchase of these premises might help them reduce the backlog, uh, then, of course, the government will look at that favourably. Stephanie Callaghan. The recruitment of new staff to the health service will play a crucial role in supporting the recovery of our NHS. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary to provide an update on the progress made since the launch of the recruitment drive in October? And can the Cabinet Secretary outline how measures in national workforce strategy will promote the growth of Scotland's remote and rural workforce in the long term? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, well, I'm delighted that we were able to announce earlier this week that we've recruited uh, over 1,000 uh, healthcare support staff, and they are in a mixture of both acute sites uh, and community. And of course, they are also uh, in, in, in both urban areas and indeed remote and, 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 and island communities, which is very positive uh, indeed. We also recruited almost uh, 200 overseas uh, registered nurses, with another 200 or over 200 actually coming on stream in the next weeks and months uh, ahead. And I should say that overseas recruitment uh, is ethical international recruitment. Uh, which is, of course, incredibly important uh, to uh, We uh, are absolutely committed to developing a sustainable healthcare workforce. Uh, and, of course, we will develop a remote and rural workforce strategy, uh, which we have committed to uh, as well. Uh, we are creating, as the member uh, is no doubt aware of, uh, a national centre for remote and rural health and social care. Uh, that is due to be operational by spring next year. And that centre itself will support recruitment, retention, ideal practice and evaluation, training, education and research. Question number four, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with the Department for Work and Pensions and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Uh, ministers and officials are in regular contact with the Department for Work and Pensions. Joint ministerial working group meetings are held twice a year, the most recent one taking place in November last year, when adult disability payment, child disability payment and Scottish child payment were discussed. The Minister for Social Security and Local Government holds regular bilateral meetings with uh, Chloe Smith, the UK Government Minister for Disabled People, Health and Work, on priorities for the delivery of devolved Social Security, the most recent of which took place last month and is a, also a well-established programme of meetings at official level on the delivery of devolved welfare benefits. Colette Stevenson. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, the Tory cost of living crisis is causing real hardship and their lack of action is staggering. 
Does she agree with me that the UK Tory government must review and increase the local housing allowance to help people with spiralling costs raise all social security payments by at least 6% to protect people from poverty and implement fair and fast compensation as requested by the WASPY women to ensure 1950s women are not further penalised? Cabinet Secretary. Um, First of all, the Scottish Government have uh, fully supported the work of the, the WASPI campaign and have uh, consistently called on the UK Government to take responsibility for the hardship caused uh, to thousands of, of women negatively impacted. On local housing uh, allowance, local housing allowance rates were last set on the 31st of March 2020 and have not been uh, elevated since. Uh, I wrote to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions on the 21st of January this year, urging her to take steps to restore them to a level that will prevent many people in Scotland having to make difficult choices between paying their rent or feeding their families and heating their home. In contrast, we did act urgently, in spite of our limited powers, by further increasing several forms of devolved social security benefits and assistance from 3.1 per cent to 6 per cent. Mercedes Vialba. Thank you. The DWP's nationwide closures include their office in Aberdeen, which leaves over 60 workers at risk of redundancy. I previously raised the prospect of these highly skilled workers being redeployed to Social Security Scotland in order to assist the rollout of new devolved benefits. The Minister at the time indicated that the Scottish Government could explore this option, but no clear commitment was given. So I ask the Minister today for a firm commitment. Will the Scottish Government work with the PCS Trade Union and the DWP to explore redeployment of these workers to Social Security Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'll certainly pick that up and write to, to the member with more detail, but um, you, she will probably be aware that uh, a number of DWP staff have been successful in moving across to Social Security uh, Scotland uh, over the, the course of Social Security Scotland uh, being up and running, and uh, a, a number of staff have moved across, obviously on a, a, a recruitment basis. Uh, but I'm happy to take forward the suggestion that she's made and look at what was said previously, and I'll write to her with more detail. Question number five, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to proceed with its commitment to mitigate any impact of the UK Government benefit cap as much as possible within the scope of its devolved powers. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. We know that households impacted by the, the benefit cap uh, lose almost uh, £2,500 per year. Uh, mitigation of the cap will help the families hardest hit by the UK Government's cuts uh, in order to help them keep their home. Uh, we will be investing up to £10 million in 2022 23 to mitigate the benefit cap as far as we can uh, within our powers. Uh, and we are working with local authorities to identify existing good practice in benefit cap mitigation and to agree how best uh, to support those affected by this damaging policy. And this additional funding will be rolled out as early as possible this year. Marie McNair. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the first conversation I had with her as a newly elected MSP was about mitigating the benefit cap, and I am delighted we are doing this. It is beyond belief that the Westminster Government are implementing a policy that denies families with children basic levels of subsistence and continues to make things even worse with a two-child policy and its abhorrent rape clause. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in condemning this approach and agree that it is no part in an independent Scotland that is dignity, fairness and respect at the heart of its approach to social security policy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I uh, wholeheartedly agree with Marie McNair uh, on that point? And can I also recognise um, her long-standing support of the, the move to mitigate the, the benefit cap? And, indeed, she did raise it uh, uh, just in the early days of her being uh, elected. We have repeatedly called on the UK Government to urgently review the, the various failings of the universal credit system, such as the two-child limit and the rape clause, which is obviously abhorrent and would have no place in uh, an independent Scotland uh, social security system. In contrast, we are committing over £3.9 billion for benefit expenditure in 2022-23, providing support to over 1 million people. And this is over £360 million above the level of funding to be received from the UK Government through the block grant adjustment, showing the investment that we are making in the people of Scotland in this important area. Question number six, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is progressing with the replacement of unsafe cladding on tall buildings. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Uh, so we will introduce legislation uh, tomorrow to ban the highest uh, risk cladding 
and combustible materials in residential and other high-risk buildings above uh, 11 metres, and that will apply from the 1st of June of this year. All unsafe cladding being replaced in our assessment and remediation programme will need to meet that standard. And our programme of single building assessments, which of course is free to homeowners, is currently underway in 25 buildings. And this will determine what, if anything, needs to be done to ensure these buildings are safe. And I expect some of these assessments, which are detailed and very complex, to be completed in the coming weeks. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. In January, the UK Government pressurised housing developers to commit to removing dangerous cladding from buildings. Three months later, we have seen no such moves from the Scottish Government. Therefore, can I, what, can I ask what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that developers remove flammable cladding from buildings as a matter of urgency? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that Alexander Stewart has asked me this question. Um, can I first of all say uh, to him, unfortunately, the Building Safety Pledge and Building Fund is for England only, despite assurances that we would work closely together to tackle building safety issues, devolved administrations have yet to have a seat at the table. We have raised deep concerns with the Welsh Government um, about this. The change from a fund to now pledge letters means less consequentials are available for the devolved nations to tackle their own cladding issues. Now, we remain open to all solutions and are currently working with several developers uh, to try and action remediation and to get that done on a voluntary basis, but it is deeply unhelpful that the UK Government um, have excluded Wales and Scotland from the Developers' Fund. And we are urgently, urgently seeking a meeting with Michael Gove to request, to request that the pledge letters cover Wales and Scotland. It is deeply disappointing that to date we have not managed to get that meeting arranged. And if uh, my colleagues on the left who are heckling from a sedentary position would perhaps refocus their attention on requesting Michael Gove to meet with Wales and Scotland because at the heart of this is a really, really important issue of unsafe cladding on buildings and that is something surely that should transcend uh, party politics. So if they can be of assistance, that would be most helpful. Question number seven, Liam McArthur. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the agricultural and fishing industries with rising fuel costs. Cabinet Secretary Mary Gujol. It is clear to all of us that Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine and the justified Western sanctions in response has impacts, and not least the hugely challenging increases in energy bills which affect households and everyone in the food industry, from farmers and processors to the fishing industry. Now, I am acutely aware of the impact that this has across the food supply chain and the particular issues for our fishing industries facing financial hardship as a result. And the continued lack of engagement from the UK Government will lead again to consternation for Scottish businesses who are dealing with an already unsettled international environment. On the 17th of March, I announced that we have convened a Food Security and Supply Task Force jointly with industry to monitor, identify and respond to these issues, as well as recommend actions that can be taken by business, the Scottish and UK governments, to mitigate against some of these challenges. And further to that, I had also written on the 4th of April to the Minister, uh, George Eustace, re requesting an urgent Four Nations Summit on the impact of fuel prices. And yesterday, the Secretary of State finally agreed to this request during a meeting and will now work with DEFRA to ensure this happens at pace. Lee MacArthur. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, while we are all feeling the pinch at the pumps, the ex uh, exceptional rise in input costs is forcing boats in Orkney uh, either to tie up or to leave the industry entirely. Uh, the combination of feed, fuel and fertiliser costs uh, threatens the very viability of many farms. Given the importance of food security, as the Cabinet Secretary recognised, uh, when would she expect the working group uh, to uh, come forward with recommendations? And will she give a commitment to implement those recommendations with absolute urgency? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, the task force was set up as a short life task force exactly to do that, to look at the short, medium and longer term actions. We had our third meeting yesterday. We will also be having our, uh, what's expected to be our last meeting shortly and we will produce a paper with a report with recommendations from that, which of course the Scottish Government will consider carefully. Thank you. That concludes general questions. And before we move on to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery the Honourable Jonathan O'Day MP, Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, Parliament of New South Wales. <laughs> 